Welcome back to our Griffith Observatory adventure. Today, we're wrapping up our journey through the Hall of the Eye and setting our sights on the Hall of the Sky. Time to explore the universe. For centuries, we've gazed at the sky, finding meaning in the sun, moon, and stars as they marked time and guided our lives. As we uncovered their secrets, we used this cosmic knowledge to craft timekeeping tools, create calendars, and find our ways across the sea. The movements of the stars shaped everything from agriculture to politics, giving power to those who could read the signs. And that's how the exciting adventure of astronomy started, all because we looked up and wondered about the universe. For California Indians, the horizon told tales of the seasons. They celebrated the sun's journey, marking the power it held over the changing times in their solstice ceremonies. By observing where the sun rises and sets, they predict nature's course. Time rules our lives, from daily routines to trade and governance. Sun deals, like the ancient Roman version at the Temple of Apollo, offered an early solution. As the sun moved, its shadow on the dial shifted, revealing the hour. Griffith Observatory's sundial works similarly, aligning with the sun's path and telling you the time by where the shadow falls. In the Andes, the Pleiades constellation signals shifts in weather and farming. Quechua Indians call it the storehouse. When they observe it after the June solstice, they hope for good weather and abundant harvest. Changes in the Pleiades' appearance reveal nature's plans, with a dimmer cluster indicating late rains. European sailors needed a celestial compass on the open ocean. They turned to Polaris, the North Star. By measuring its height above the horizon with a cross staff, they determined their latitude. Griffith Observatory's Belen Navigation Mural captures this history, reminding us that even today, finding Polaris reveals your northward journey. 16th century astronomer Tycho Brahe sought accuracy in studying the sky. His engraved metal quadrant allowed precise measurements, setting new standards. Observers in his time recorded celestial objects' positions and time as they crossed the north-south meridian. Griffith Observatory's Gottlieb Transit Corridor carries on Bry's legacy as a modern tool for tracking the sky. In the Extending the Eye exhibit, we'll dive into the impact of telescopes on our understanding of the cosmos. Back in 1609, Galileo Galilei learned of the telescope, a device that could magnify distant objects. So, he fashioned his own telescope using tubes and lenses and aimed it at the night sky. Galileo's telescope allowed him to spot stars within the Milky Way, chart the moon's surface, and reveal Jupiter's hidden moon. This game-changing work fundamentally shifted our cosmic perspective but as we delve further into the realm of telescopes, it's essential to grasp their fundamental function. Telescopes are essentially cosmic light buckets. They collect light from celestial objects and then use lenses and mirrors to focus this light for our eyes. This optical pathway is the same across all telescopes, from the ones we use in our backyards to those in cutting edge observatories. Telescopes enable us to explore things that are smaller, fainter, and farther than what our eyes can notice. After the telescope's invention, astronomers raced to build even larger and more advanced instruments. They improved lenses to enhance the view and extended the tubes to capture larger images. One ambitious telescope, constructed by Johannes Hevelius in 1673, reached a staggering 150 feet in length. Yet these early telescopes were hard to align and gusts of wind often knocked them off course. It wasn't until later that astronomers found ways to build more stable and effective telescopes. Many personal and smaller research telescopes are refractors, like the 36-inch Great Lick Refractor at Lick Observatory. Light enters one end of the telescope, passing through curved glass lenses, and then it's focused into an eyepiece at the opposite end. This is the kind of telescope Galileo used to make his groundbreaking discoveries. Refracting telescopes were the primary instruments used in observatories until the 1800s. Reflectors, on the other hand, use a primary mirror to collect light and bounce it back to a secondary mirror. From there, the light is directed into an eyepiece. 
Nowadays, most modern research observatories utilize reflectors, such as the 120-inch Shane Telescope at Lick Observatory. To study the distant and the dim, we need to magnify what we see through telescopes. When a telescope magnifies a view, it makes objects appear larger and nearer, enhancing our ability to scrutinize them. The level of magnification indicates how many times bigger an object appears when viewed through a telescope. So, if you see something at 20x magnification, it looks 20 times larger and closer. Our very first and most crucial astronomical tool is the eye. Before Galileo's era, early astronomers depended on simple instruments and visual observations to record their findings. Their meticulous drawings and detailed notes documented the positions, movements, and brightness of celestial objects. When we observe the moon with our naked eye, we see it at a magnification of 1x, which is its normal size. Telescopes equipped with eyepieces can magnify the view. When you magnify your view of the moon, it seems closer, more significant, and you can spot its craters, lava plains, and mountains in vivid detail. As telescopes gained popularity, astronomical records grew more intricate. The micrometer was the first tool paired with a telescope, enabling astronomers to measure precise separations between celestial objects. With the rise of film cameras, astronomers abandoned sketches and instead captured actual images of the night sky. By using time exposures, they could collect more light from celestial objects, revealing their hidden beauty. But the true game changer was the CCD camera. These highly sensitive cameras captured light from distant and dim objects across various wavelengths, transforming them into computerized records. Most modern observatories rely on CCD cameras for detailed high-resolution images and precise measurements. This exhibit also explored the dispersion of light into its constituent colors, commonly observed when sunlight passes through a prism. It forms a beautiful rainbow of colors, representing just a fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. In modern astronomy, we examine the entire spectrum of light emanating from celestial objects with the aid of spectrographs and spectroscopes, which disassemble light into its constituent wavelengths. For an in-depth look into this process, be sure to check out the Beyond Visible panel, featured in part one of the Griffith Observatory video. So, while our planet's atmosphere sustains life, it does pose challenges for astronomers observing space. But fear not, for they have devised ingenious solutions. They've either placed observatories in space, above the atmosphere, or incorporated adaptive optics into ground space telescopes. Adaptive optic systems deploy laser beams to create artificial guide stars in the atmosphere. These serve as reference points to assess atmospheric distortion, allowing the system to make constant micro-adjustments to the telescope's mirrors. The outcome? A clearer and more defined view as if the atmosphere weren't interfering. Now, in certain situations where an object is incredibly remote or surrounded by a crowd of other celestial bodies, making detailed observations can be quite a challenge. Astronomers' solution, construct larger telescopes whenever possible. And when that's not an option, they employ interferometry, a technique that combines light from two or more telescopes, creating a composite image with the sharpness and detail of a much larger telescope. This ingenious method is used in both optical and radio telescopes today, creating super observatories capable of delivering the sharpness you'd expect from a significantly larger telescope. So there you have it, the fascinating world of telescopes where humanity's quest to understand the cosmos continues to unfold. Look up at the night sky and you'll see stars no matter where you are on Earth. But for astronomers, the choice of where to observe is important. They seek clear skies and good weather to unlock the secrets of the universe. And so, it was in the late 1800s that astronomers set their sights on California in search of steady mountaintop air and pristine skies. They had a mission to build the world's largest observatories and uncover the universe's hidden truths. Their discoveries would change how we see the cosmos, inspiring amateur stargazers and shaping places like Griffith Observatory for the public to enjoy. The golden era of California astronomy and astrophysics began with Lick Observatory, 
followed by Mount Wilson Observatory and Palomar Observatory. In the heart of the San Gabriel Mountains, Mount Wilson Observatory stands as a modern beacon of cosmic exploration. It's a place where history and cutting-edge technology merge, a hub of discovery dedicated to studying both the sun and the night sky. Here, the Hooker Telescope reigned as the world's largest for 30 years. Constructed by George Ellery Hale, this telescope saw the first light in 1917. Astronomers like Edwin Hubble used it to unravel the universe's secrets, expanding the horizons of our knowledge. The Hale Telescope at Palomar Observatory, with its 200-inch mirror allowing astronomers to explore the most remote galaxies, creating massive telescope mirrors presented significant challenges, and California astronomers overcame them. With careful precision, they ground and polished mirrors to perfection, sculpting them to capture light from the furthest reaches of the universe. It was a slow, painstaking process, but it yielded mirrors that could capture light from the farthest reaches of the universe. California astronomers are not just stars in their own right. They illuminate the global stage. They investigate every corner of the universe, from our humble solar system to the most distant galaxies. Whether observing from the Lick Observatory or launching spaceborne instruments from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they make groundbreaking discoveries and inspire the next generation of stargazers. In the past, astronomy felt exclusive with closed observatory doors, but times are changing. Lick Observatory and others now welcome the public, offering tours, lectures, and websites to share their cosmic explorations with everyone. Griffith Observatory, known as the People's Observatory, opened in 1935, giving Los Angeles citizens the opportunity to explore the stars. Today, visitors can enjoy science exhibits, telescopes, and planetarium shows to quench their curiosity about the cosmos. Griffith Observatory has witnessed unforgettable cosmic events, like the dramatic collision of Comet Shoemaker, Levy 9 with Jupiter, where thousands gathered to witness this celestial spectacle. Whether you call Los Angeles home or you're just passing through as a tourist, be sure to pay a visit. Finally, let's explore the Amundsen Hall of the Sky, where we uncover the incredible dance between the sun, the moon, and earth. Inside the hall, you'll find six small rooms, each like a little world of its own. These rooms dive into exciting subjects like day and night, the paths of the sun and stars, the magic of seasons, the monthly moon phases, the mysterious tide, and the wonder of eclipses. First up, we have the day and night exhibit, where we explore the basics of time divisions. On our planet, there's a line between light and darkness. When the sun shines on one side, it's daytime. And when it's not, it's nighttime. Where you are on Earth decides when the sun shows up, how long it stays, and where it marches across the sky. All this happens because the Earth spins from west to east. This spin makes it seem like everything in the sky is on a journey from east to west. The sun, for instance, makes its grand entrance in the east, giving us the bright hours of the day. Then it takes a bow in the west, and that's when we start our journey into the night. Now, you might wonder, why do the hours of daylight change? Well, three things have a say in it. The Earth's tilt on its axis, your latitude, and the time of the year. And how do we humans cope with these constant day to night switches? It tends to affect us in many ways. When the sun is out, we're buzzing with energy and go about our business. But when night falls, we cozy up and rest. We've got electricity to extend our day into the night. But unfortunately, all that artificial light messes with the astronomer's starry view. So it's a bit of a balancing act between bright lights and dark skies. Let's move on to the sun and star paths room, where we'll unravel the mysteries of the celestial dance happening up there. Every single day, it seems like the sun, the moon, planets, and stars all rise in the east and gracefully set in the west. Well, in fact, it's our Earth that's doing a slow and steady spin from west to east, taking us along for the ride. So, to us, it looks like the whole sky is strolling from east to west. Then, what about the sun's seasonal tracks? 
In the summertime, the sun rises and sets up north, reaching its highest point in the sky at noon. When winter rolls in, the sun makes its entrance and exit a bit southward and stays lower in the sky all day. Well, the sun's track isn't actually up to the sun. It's Earth and its tilt that determine the seasonal track of the sun. And at night, the stars and planets appear to follow the same route, just like the sun does during the day. But what you see depends on when you're looking. The sun's so bright during the day that we don't notice the star patterns. At night, it's the stars on the opposite side of the sky, away from the sun's glow that appears. Fast forward six months and different stars take the spotlight because Earth's position in its orbit keeps changing. It's like a cosmic show where the stage is constantly shifting and our planet's the star of the show. Up next is the fascinating season segment of the exhibit. Every few months, Earth likes to switch things up with four main seasons. Spring, summer, fall, and winter. But why does this happen? Well, it's all because our planet has a little tilt on its axis. This tilt keeps the north and south poles pointing in the same direction in space throughout the year. So when one half of Earth tilts toward the sun, we get summer. The other half that tilts away from the sun experiences winter. During summer, the sun makes the days longer and the nights shorter. And since it's high in the sky and stays out longer, it showers us with its light as well as heat at a steep angle. But when winter arrives, the sun makes the days shorter and the nights longer. The Earth's surface and the air around it cool down because they're getting less of the sun's warmth. The winter sun stays low in the sky during the day, casting its light at a shallow angle. And that's why we bundle up in the colder months. Here we have the mesmerizing world of moon phases. Usually, we don't get to see the moon change its shape in just a few minutes like you can here, but in the real world, it's a slow and gradual transformation over a few weeks. Moon phases are all about how the moon appears in our sky during both the day and night. These changes happen because of the changing arrangement between the sun, the moon, and our very own Earth. Three key things determine what the moon looks like during its monthly cycle. How fast it spins, how it moves around our planet, and how much of its surface the sun lights up. The moon does one full spin on its axis while orbiting Earth, and this takes about 27.3 days. This means we always see the same side of the moon from our earthly view. The moon goes through a beautiful transformation over approximately 29.5 days. It starts as a delicate crescent in the sky, gradually turning into a brilliant full moon that brightens our nights. Then, it takes another two weeks to gently shrink back into a crescent before briefly vanishing during the new moon. A few days later, it reappears as a crescent again. This repeating cycle is what we call a month. And here's a fun fact. Did you know that when you gaze at the moon, you're always looking at the same side? It wasn't until spacecraft images gave us some sneak peeks that we got a glimpse of the other side, the far side. It turned out to be a wild lunar landscape full of rugged terrain and craters. Even though it's sometimes called the dark side, it gets just as much sunlight as the side that faces our Earth. If you live by the sea, you've probably seen the tides, those daily water shows where the ocean rises and falls like clockwork. We use these tides to our advantage, especially for getting ships into port. When it's high tide, the water's deep enough for smooth sailing, but during low tide, things can get a bit tricky as the ocean levels drop and ships might find themselves stuck near the shore. And guess who is the culprit that makes tides possible? For ages, people had a hunch that the moon might be involved because, well, one of the daily high tides seemed to happen right when the moon was passing by overhead. The gravity of the moon and the sun are pulling on Earth and causing bulges in the oceans. As our planet rotates through these bulges, we get high and low tides. The size of these tides depends on where the moon and sun are in relation to Earth. And get this, the shape of the land near the shore matters too. You see, the most traumatic tidal shows happen in places where the land funnels the water into narrow inlets and bays. There, the water can't spread out, so it goes up and down like a gentle roller coaster ride throughout the day. The Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, Canada, takes the crown for the world's biggest tides. Here. The Atlantic Ocean rushes in and out, creating tides that rise and fall more than 50 feet at its narrowest points. 
and during low tide, the ocean floor is unveiled, exposing vast tidal flats. Let's head over to the last room where we will unravel the mysteries of eclipses. These cosmic shows happen when one celestial object slides into the shadow of another. When they line up just right, we get to witness these breathtaking moments. For a solar eclipse, the moon passes in front of the sun. When we find ourselves in the narrow path of totality, also known as the umbral region, the sun vanishes quickly for a few minutes. All we see is the sun's ghostly corona and the sky turns dark. The temperature drops and the planets make a special appearance. If you're outside this shadowy zone, the penumbral area, you'll witness a partial eclipse and the sky stays relatively bright. So, what happens when Earth decides to eclipse the moon? This show unfolds during a full moon and for a few hours, you'll watch the moon gradually darken as it slips into Earth's shadow. Then, it begins to make its way back to its usual brightness. During the peak of this event, the moon can even take on a beautiful coppery red hue. This is because Earth's atmosphere bends the sun's red light around our planet and sends it toward the moon. Now, if you've ever wondered about seeing a total solar eclipse, it's quite a spectacle. Some people known as eclipse chasers journey to places often in remote areas just to experience a few minutes of totality and witness the stunning solar corona. If you don't make the trek to a total solar eclipse, you might never get the chance to see one. But lunar eclipses are a bit more accessible. They can be spotted from over half of Earth, and you can catch one every year or so without having to pack your bags. Next, let's explore the final exhibits in the Hall of the Sky. Here, we dive into the incredible world of elements. You see, everything around us, from the cells in our bodies to the air we breathe and even the materials that make up our planets, has a remarkable connection to the stars. The story begins with the two most abundant elements in the universe, hydrogen and helium. These two elements were born in the Big Bang over 13 billion years ago, but that's just the beginning. Other elements, like oxygen and iron, have a more exciting origin story. They are forged deep within the fiery hearts of stars. When these stars reach the end of their lives, they explode in magnificent supernovas, scattering these newly created elements, even heavier ones like gold and uranium, out into space. Now, why are these elements so special? Because they are the cosmic building blocks. Whether you're looking at the sun, stars, the silicon chips in your computer, or the cells in your own body, all of them are made up of these elemental pieces. In a way, we are all part of this cosmic recycling process. Billions of years ago, everything inside you, from the calcium in your bones to the iron in your blood, was created inside an ancient star. Even the skin cells on your hand contain these cosmic elements. Let's break it down further. Hydrogen is the lightest and most fundamental element with just one proton, one electron, and an atomic number of one. Everything heavier, up to uranium at atomic number 92, is produced inside star. But here's where it gets fascinating. Scientists armed with powerful nuclear accelerators can create elements with atomic numbers higher than 92 by smashing smaller atoms together. Elements like neptunium, californium, and even plutonium are examples of what they've discovered. To understand this cosmic connection, you need to know about atoms. Atoms are the basic units of elements and make up everything in the universe. They consist of three main particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. When you break it down, every structure in the cosmos is a unique combination of atoms from various elements. Take a look at a tiny carbon droplet about a tenth of the width of a human hair, which holds thousands of atoms. When you consider the composition of the human body, it's mostly hydrogen and oxygen, with traces of other elements. Stars and the elements they produce play a crucial role in the universe's ongoing renewal. When stars reach the end of their life cycles and explode, their materials scatter throughout space, serving as the seeds for new generations of stars. Now, some of the heaviest elements in existence are born in massive stellar explosions like Supernova 1987A. These outbursts create conditions of extreme temperature and pressure, causing atoms to fuse and form even more complex elements like lead, gold, 
and uranium. For the final exhibit of the Hall of the Sky, we delve into the incredible star that's right at the center of our solar system, the Sun. It's the most crucial star in our sky, providing us with light and warmth. Being so close, the Sun helps us learn not just about itself, but also about the countless other stars in the Milky Way galaxy. In the vast cosmos, there are over a hundred billion stars, each with its unique story. Some are massive and hot supergiants, while others are more like our sun. The smallest stars, known as cool dwarfs, are actually the most numerous. Stars, including our sun, glow due to incredible nuclear reactions occurring in their cores, converting hydrogen into helium as energy and radiating it as light. If we were to chart stars based on their temperature and brightness, most of them would fall into a category called the main sequence. Compared to the extremes of the giant and dwarf stars, our sun is just the right balance in terms of temperature and brightness. As you explore this exhibit, you'll discover the fascinating diversity of stars. You'll also get to witness our local star, the sun, in action through captivating time-lapse movies. These movies are a mesmerizing way to observe the constant activity on the sun's surface. If you would like to see a real-time view of our sun, the observatory provides three telescopes to do just that. Remember, these telescopes operate during clear daytime hours, so you can't observe the sun at night. Don't forget to explore the stunning photographs of the sun from various observatories on Earth and in space displayed in the rotunda. And that wraps up our journey through the second room at Griffith Observatory. Join us in part three as we delve into the Zeiss telescope and explore the lower level of the observatory. Until then, be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment telling us where you'd like to explore next.